then Sister Big Home, and thirdly, Seminary Mark De Clama. <laughs> spirit of love which draws people together. May we give witness to the force of love that keeps us together in one community, where each one of us is the best for other. May we see in one another the missing part that we should have. And may that spirit of unity and love begins here. Amen. 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 Welcome to my presentation, and thank you for coming. You're welcome. Some people have asked me why my topic doesn't sound like philosophy. It is understandable to me because many students still think that philosophy is something abstract. In fact, it is. But it is also very practical. That's why I chose to work on this topic, because I think that this topic is very applicable and relevant to the Bible College community as well as SPD Catechism. <coughs> Let's walk with me through this presentation to see what we can apply. My presentation is very simple, includes three parts. Introduction, welcoming the other in the Venus, and welcoming the other in intercultural living. Emmanuel Levinas was a French philosopher. He was born in 1906 and he died in 1995. He was influenced mostly by Herschel and Heidegger. So why the idea of welcoming the other is so important for you? Because, as we can see, we are unique. We are very different from one another. Even within your family, you are not exactly the same as your parents or your siblings. But we are called to live and work together. So how to harmonize all the differences among us? And the idea of the Venus welcoming the other can be of help for us. Let's see what he's going to do and what he's going to tell us. Unlike other philosophers, who think that the source of ethics is from reason, like Immanuel Kant, or from the principle of utility, is like utilitarianism, or from the will of God, like Thomas Aquinas. For Levinas, he believed that the source of ethics is the interpersonal relation between people. Let me give you an example. Suppose that I am the only person living in this house. When I want to eat all the apples in the refrigerator, I don't have to worry about anything or consider about anyone. I just go ahead and do it. But if there are some people living with me, when I want to do that, I have to... is used to govern the way in which we relate to each other. So, who is the other? Very simple. The other is other person rather than oneself. Whoever we directly encounter in our daily lives. And you notice that it is a singular form. Why is that? Because he wants to focus on the one-time encounter, a direct contact with the other. What is the face of the other? The face of the other is the living present, the whole being of the other. And he, this face of the other expresses itself and speaks directly to us. 
In his book, he said that the face of the other at each moment The host of the house, and if I still remain as a host, I am not truly welcoming him. Now, in order to understand him, to welcome him, I have to become a guest. And here, the other has all the privilege and the space to reveal himself to me. And the other now even becomes dominant over me. Nothing can block me between, block between me and the other, so that he can freely reveal himself to me. In that sense, we have to accept the otherness of the other, because when we come into contact like that, we find some differences, and we come to accept it. And to continue explain uh, his idea, he come up with two steps in order to welcome the other. The first one is proximity. It means nearness, closeness. We have to believe that the other is not far from us. They are very close. And we do not label or put a mask on the face of the other according to what we think. We cannot come close or enter the house of the other if we do not believe that he or she is close to us. And just as we are standing in his or her shoes. And this idea leads to the second step is substitution. This is what it means by substitution. And when we see this, we may have an idea of, oh, it seems like we are denying ourselves, but in fact it's not, because it is not the alienation of self, but a recurrence to oneself, because the self is to conceive outside. <coughs> it never ends at oneself, but goes to the heater side of oneself, which is the other. Just like the image of an iceberg, we know very little about ourselves, very little. That's why we assist through the other and for the other without being alienated from myself. And for him, the term I in his philosophy means he I am, answering for everything and for everyone. An emptying of oneself for the other. So seeing the others already motivates me and urges me to respond to the other. And the responsibility becomes the link between me and the other person. To clarify this point, I want to give you an example. For example, you are walking on the street and then you see a person pushing a garbage can. And then you see another person pushing an old man like Father Fusher to the chapel. <laughs> How are you going to respond to these two situations? The first, you may have no response. Nothing is urging in you. But the second one, when you see a person pushing another person through the traffic, 
something inside us like urging us, motivating us, and asking us to respond, to do something to set the line of the question. So that's why, that's what it means by we having the responsibility towards the other. So how we can apply all those ideas of Levinus to <coughs> the kind of living? Let's move to the third part of my presentation. I want to distinguish between two terms, multicultural and intercultural. Multicultural is a sociological and anthropological term. It relates to a social reality. Whereas intercultural is a theological word, and it is a faith-based undertaking. Why is that? Three reasons. The first reason, because faith is lived culturally. We live our faith, we practice our faith mostly according to our cultures. And in that sense, when we have an intercultural community with different people from different cultures, we may see a lot of differences. In order to integrate all that, we need a conversion. And what is a conversion? A conversion is not simply an individual process happening at once, but a process of continuous personal change and growth with and for the members of the community. It means that every one of us need to do something, need to change, and need to adapt to the cultures. And the third reason that we have to have faith in the necessity of the conversion. We have to see that, oh, this is necessary that I have to change. Because faith leads to action. There are some stumbling blocks in intercultural communication. I want to present three of them. The first one is the assumption of similarities. We often think that when we have human common needs, common interests, we are similar, we are the same. But in fact, it's not. And people want to think that we are the same because they are afraid of differences. The second problem is that the pre-perception and stereotypes. Why do people want to have some kind of stereotypes on other people? Because they want to reduce the threat of the unknown. If I see that someone is different from me, I, feel, I don't feel very comfortable. So I want to put some label on them so that I can make them predictable. And the third is the tendency to evaluate. We usually favor our own culture. When we look at the other culture, people doing something, and we say, oh, that's bad. My culture is better. This is how I do it in my culture, and it's much better than yours. And when we do that, we see only the negative things. Next, I want to present to you the meaning of community. Community is described from the word communitas, Latin. It means the same. And this word is derived from the word communis. That means together. And this is my invention. When I look at the word community, I see the word unity is a part of the word community. But, and I come up with the conclusion that to be in community is to be one. So, in an intercultural community, we have people from different cultures. That's the reality. Now, we have to do something to make these differences become one. And how to do that? First, we have to accept the other. For Levinas, culture can be called love. Why? Because, because culture signifies the otherness of the other, from which we come into contact with the other. And we cannot ignore the otherness of the other because this is a reality. So we should not reduce to the same. If we consider culture 
as an op not as an optical, but a bridge in which we can come into contact with the others. Culture can become love because it can bind all of us together. We have to respect and accept all the cultures, and this is a way of showing love to the other culture. Second, we have to remove all biases and prejudices. We try not to put a thick mask on the face of the other according to how we want to see them. For Buddha, he said, wisdom is seeing a thing in its true nature without name and label. We can use the two steps of the Venus idea. We have to believe that the other is very close to us, very near to us, so we are open to listen to them. And also, we <coughs> believe that we have the responsibility towards the other, so that we can do something and we pay attention. We go in responsible and be in contact with them. My conclusion. This is what I hope that you can remember with the long information that I've just uh, given you. Acknowledge the otherness of the other because if there were no difference, there would be no need for reconciliation. Being open to accept and learn about the other. Get rid of our biases and stereotypes. Allow the other to reveal itself to us as how it truly is. We change our thinking so that we can change how we see the others and how we relate to them. And this is my success. Thank you for your listening.
uh, uh, I was very afraid of talking to him, and also because of the limit uh, limit of English. You know, he was in level one, and uh, he could not speak very well. So we didn't really talk to each other for the whole semester. <laughs> but he. And at, at, at that point, you know, I see the closeness, the closeness, and I kind of, from that experience, I see, oh, they are not very different from me. They want to be close to me. It is me that block that kind of uh, uh, relationship, you know. So from that point on, I try to open and talk to different people. And uh, uh, yeah, so I, I think that they trust me. and. Uh, they, they want to talk to me. So. But do you trust them? That was my question. Sure. From that experience, I trust that they are close to me and they, they want to relate to me. It's not like I am different from them. So, so they, they had to do it first. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 from that experience, they got to do it first. Yeah. I actually got a question. I don't know why. But, uh... They like, let's say your old man, your dad, says, "Don't go talking to that guy because he's done these things, or his dad has done these things." Would the son or daughter of that guy like not talk to him or be antisocial to a group of people? Is that like a thing, you know? Actually, it, it can be, and it mostly unconscious, you know, because you uh, grow up with your family, and then it's it's just a part of you. But like, um, mm, I, from my experience, I say like, because I live in a village, like in a country, in a village that only Vietnamese around. For example, if you live in the city, you may see uh, some tourists from different countries. So you kind of like seeing them and interact or even talk to them. But for me, I live in a small village and I, didn't see anybody like that. So when I come here, I have to see different people uh, from different countries, like black, white, you know, something like that. So I kind of was afraid. Bad. I was afraid because of that. Because I never had that kind of experience and contact with those people. Yeah. So yes? Yes. OK, cool. louder. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for the Thank you. Is able. Um, how, how, how can you understand by advice?